asking God to do His will is not the opposite of faith. It is itself the expression of faith because you're trusting God knows exactly what He's doing. And the blockage in the road for many of us in our lives and our circumstances is we're not prepared to say, Your will be done because when we do, then we can relax. Your will be done. We all know that media is a powerful tool. Whether it's television, radio, or internet, the influence media has on people around the world is profound. Even in some of the most remote regions of the world, invariably someone has a television, a satellite dish, a cell phone, or a computer. However, television, radio, and internet coverage is very expensive. And the biggest expense is television and radio broadcast time. We buy this airtime. We partner with networks to reach as many people as possible and use the donations of our viewers as efficiently as we can. You, our viewers and donors, help us pay for the broadcast time and production. In this way, Living Truth is your program. For without you, our supporters, we cannot buy the airtime. We can't produce, package, promote, or broadcast the gospel in this way around the world. Many of you know that we currently broadcast in over 60 countries all over the globe. We translate into Spanish and Arabic and have subtitles in numerous other languages. For example, 
we reach Chinese communities and Arabic-speaking communities in many parts of the world. In India, we broadcast to millions of households. All this is possible because we pay for broadcast airtime as you enable us to do so. For nearly 15 years, I've asked for your support with our airtime costs. And each year, you respond with a heartfelt and generous yes. We want to continue being a sustainable, financially sound media ministry, and we can only do that with your help. I'm asking you this Christmas season to help us stay in good standing with our broadcast stations so we can continue to help people all over the world and perhaps to help you too. In this season of giving, I'm asking you to partner with us in reaching the world with the life-changing news of Jesus. And may I say thank you to the many of you who continually bless Living Truth with your faithful gifts month after month, year after year. I wish you and your families a very happy and blessed Christmas. To help support our airtime costs, send a check to the address on your screen. To donate with a credit card, call toll-free 1-888-269-6085. To make a secure online donation, visit us at livingtruth.ca. You can also text DONATE to our toll-free number. Living Truth is a registered charity, and all donations are tax deductible. This is a special message from Charles Price called, Prayer You Wished You Hadn't Prayed. If you've got your Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn to 2 Kings and chapter 20. 2 Kings and chapter 20. And I'm going to read from these verses in just a, a few moments. We had a wonderful message last Sunday on the theme of prayer. And she based it on Hezekiah's prayer in Isaiah 37. There is a lot about Hezekiah that we ought to know and don't know. Fifteen chapters are given over to Hezekiah's life in the Old Testament, in 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, and in the book of Isaiah. And the message last week opened up the week of prayer that we've had this week. Some of you have been involved in the prayer chain, people praying around the clock. Some of you involved in the day of prayer that we had here yesterday. But we don't just want it to be a week of prayer, we want it to be a habitual uh, life of prayer that we pray together. I want to close this week of prayer, though, this morning by going back to King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was one of the best of the kings of Judah. His Life and reign is summarized in 2 Kings 18. I'll just read you from verse 5 to verse 7, just a couple of chapters before the real passage I'm going to read in a moment. 2 Kings 18, verse 5 says, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him, he held fast the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. What a summary of a brilliant, godly man who had led Judah. And he was, in particular, a man of prayer. Twelve times it speaks of Hezekiah stopping to pray, or it uses the phrase that he was seeking the Lord, or he sought the Lord. He and Isaiah, who was the prophet who was contemporary with Hezekiah, sometimes met together just to pray. They'd meet and pray for the issues that they were dealing with. So Hezekiah was a man who knew God, he trusted God, he obeyed God, and the summary of his reign in 2 Kings 18, verse 3, is he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. 
When he came to the throne, the nation of Judah was sitting vulnerably between the two superpowers of the day, Assyria in the north, who were advancing. They were on an upward momentum. And Egypt in the south were more in a defense position. And Judah was sandwiched between them and served as a sort of buffer state so that if Assyria was to invade Egypt, it would have to first come through Judah and vice versa. If Egypt was to try and take on some of the Assyrian territory, have to come through Judah so each side would get plenty of warning. So there was some, some good reason in leaving Judah intact. But because Assyria was rising in its power, they wanted, under their king Sennacherib, to come in and conquer Judah, set themselves up then for a battle against Egypt. And one day, King Hezekiah received an ultimatum from Sennacherib, and that was to give up peacefully. You either give up peacefully, or we come in and we utterly destroy you. And he received a letter from Sennacherib, brought to him by his representatives, and it's a long letter, but part of it said in uh, chapter 19 and verse 10, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Your dependence on your God, he says, is a deception. And then he tells them how many surrounding nations were destroyed by the Assyrians, even though they depended on their gods, which didn't help them one little bit. And so as this letter came to Hezekiah, he spread it out before the Lord. One of the, one of the images from last week, uh, for me anyway, was this whole idea of spreading out before the Lord the message that had come from King Sennacherib. And then the text gives a dialogue where the king of Assyria says, and then you hear, the God of Israel says. The king says. The Lord says. The king wants. God wants. And this dialogue goes back between the Assyrians and Judah, between Sennacherib and Hezekiah. And this is a dialogue that's familiar to us and is in every age, but is a familiar to one to us in our day where the people say, God says, on the other hand, our culture says, but the Bible says, the world wants, God wants. And we can listen either to what the world is saying, to what our culture is saying, to what people are saying, and we let that be the criteria. Usually we're intimidated by that. We feel we don't have the courage to stand up to that, or... We know what God says, what his word says, what the Lord says. And Hezekiah, standing between these two, stands for what God says, stands for what the Lord says. And he did so because he'd taken time to lay out this letter that he'd been sent before the Lord, and he listened to what God said. He didn't try to guess what God might say. He didn't superimpose his own ideas and then say, this is what God says, but it's really my own ideas. That's taking the name of the Lord in vain when we do that. But he actually asked God. He laid the issues before him. He listened to God. And God spoke to him. And in the end of chapter 19, God gave Hezekiah a massive David and Goliath kind of victory over the Assyrians. 185,000 Assyrians died. And they went back to Assyria with their tails between their legs and so humiliated was Sennacherib, the king. When he got back home, two of his sons assassinated him because they couldn't bear the humiliation that came from the defeat of Assyria by this little group of people in Judah. Now, this is all background to what I want to talk to you about here in chapter 20. But bearing in mind, they've just seen this fantastic 
victory over the Assyrians when verse 1 of chapter 20 says, in those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, this is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you are going to die, you will not recover. Pretty direct, isn't it? Pretty blunt. This is a word from God to you, Hezekiah, put your house in order, you're going to die. You will not recover from this sickness. But I suggest to you, it was also a very kind message. Would that we were straight and honest when we're dealing with issues of death. We cloak it, disguise it, that we don't face it. And Hezekiah is being given the opportunity to prepare for death. We need to prepare for death. In the summer of 2014, when I knew my heart was uh, not behaving, I went to see my cardiologist, and he did a series of tests on me. He said, uh, now I can do one of two things you choose. I can tell you what I will do to help you to deal with this issue, or I can tell you what the actual issue is. But some people don't like that, but I'll let you make the choice. I said, no, I'm okay about that. Tell me what the issue actually is. So he, he, he said to me, uh, your heart muscle is deteriorating quite significantly, and you are a candidate for sudden death. Tell your wife, tell your family, so they're not taken by surprise by this. And having said that to me, he said, but my job now is to, this is his phrase, to delay your mortality. <laughs> so I said, well, thank you very much. I, I actually have immortality in my back pocket already, but <laughs> delaying my physical mortality w will be good. But I appreciated the directness of that. I really did. He later revised it to a 50% chance of living for five years. But nevertheless, when you know there's an issue that's sitting over you like this, like was true for me uh, in the summer of uh, 2014, it's good to face it and to be honest about it and enable you to prepare for death, which is going to come to all of us anyway. So this is Isaiah's message to Hezekiah. You're going to die. I know it because this is what the Lord says. So put your house in order. Get your will sorted out. You know, make sure you've got succession planned and uh, you are not going to recover. It turns Hezekiah to prayer. Prayer had been Hezekiah's instinct when he was in trouble anyway. But this prayer that he prays now is a sort of moaning kind of prayer. Let me read it to you in verse 2 and 3. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord, how I've walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Turns his face to the wall, cries out to God, and he weeps bitterly, and they are tears of selfishness, self-pity. He doesn't want to die, and of course he doesn't want to die. He's only 39 years old at this stage. It's far too early to die. So Isaiah, meantime, having delivered the message, left the court, and before he had left the building, the middle court of the building, God spoke to him again. Let me read it in verse 4. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father, David, says. I have heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. I will heal you. 
On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life. This is a remarkable turnabout. I've heard your prayer, Hezekiah. Isaiah, change the message. Go back and tell him, I've heard his prayer. I've seen his tears. I will heal him, and I'll give him another 15 years. So in verse 7, Isaiah said, prepare a poultice of figs, and they did so and applied it to the boil, and he recovered. By the way, don't, don't think that for God to heal bypasses medicine. Isaiah prepared some medicine as well for him. But six verses after he was told, you will die, put your house in order, he is well again. And he's healthy with the promise of 15 more years. Something feels wrong about this story, doesn't it? There's a mixed message that Isaiah brought to Hezekiah. Set your house in order, you're going to die. No ambiguity, not maybe you will. Not if you're not careful, you might. You are going to die. Set your house in order. And then the message comes, God is going to heal you. You're not going to die. You'll add 15 years to your life. We have great difficulty with the idea of God changing his mind, of saying one thing and then doing another in such a short space of time. This is not unique to this story here, and we're not going to sidetrack onto that whole question, but there are a number of times when God said one thing, but actually did another. When Jonah was sent to Nineveh, which was actually the capital of Assyria, he, he told them, in 40 days, you will be destroyed. That was the message that he was given to give to them. But the people repented, and God withdrew his judgment on them, and Jonah, you remember, became angry with God because God had not done what he had told Jonah to tell the people he would do. You told me to tell them I'd just, you destroyed them in 40 days. You're not doing that. That totally undermines my credibility now. And he sat down, you remember, and complained. In the wilderness, after the people had built a golden calf, God's anger burned against them, and he said, I will destroy them. And Exodus 32, Moses interceded. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened them. King James says God repented. Actually, in Jonah, it says God repented. That literally means change his mind. In the book of Amos, chapter 7, verse 4, this is what the Lord showed me. The sovereign Lord was calling for judgment by fire. It dried up the great deep and devoured the land. Then I cried out, sovereign Lord, I beg you, stop. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. So the Lord relented. King James again says the Lord repented. This will not happen, the Lord said. Now, these may be anthropomorphic statements. In other words, uh, helping us understand God's action in human terms that we're able to understand. But nevertheless, they are there. And it was here in Hezekiah's case. You will die. He pleaded with God. You will not die. You will have another 15 years. But here's the rub. Hezekiah did recover, and he had 15 more good years. He continued his good work that he had done in the preceding 14 years that he'd been on the throne. At the end of 15 years, he went back to bed and died, right on schedule. And at the end of chapter 20 and verse 21, it says, Hezekiah rested with his fathers, and Manasseh, his son, succeeded him as king. Next verse, which is a chapter division between it, is chapter 21, verse 1 now. The next verse says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. If you know anything at all about Manasseh, he was the most evil king who ever reigned in Judah. If Hezekiah was the best king, his son Manasseh was the most evil king. He undid all the good his father had done. He rebuilt altars to Baal and Asherah poles. He turned to astrology, to witchcraft, 
to sorcery and spiritism. He, con- he, he communicated with spirits. He even took two of his own sons to a pagan altar that built in the temple of the Lord, and he s- held them up and slit their throats and poured their blood onto the altar of this pagan god. The most evil king had ever reigned in Judah. I have no doubt he was possessed. He reigned for 55 years. By the way, at the end of those 55 years, he had a dramatic conversion, almost a deathbed conversion. But do some math here. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he became king when his father died 15 years too late. What does that tell you about Manasseh? Manasseh should never have been. Hezekiah didn't know that three years after he had been saved from death, he would father the most evil king that ever reigned in Judah. When Manasseh was born, I have no doubt Hezekiah was thrilled to bits. At last, I've got a successor. I've got an heir to my throne. Beautiful little baby boy. (laughs) What does that tell you about Manasseh? It tells you he should never have been. Three years after his recovery, Manasseh was born. And this can teach us some very important things. I, I gave us a title to my message today, Prayer you wish you hadn't prayed. And I suggest there are three unhealthy factors in this prayer. And they have to do with Hezekiah's walk, they have to do with his world, and they have to do with his will. And you'll see why uh, I've made that division in a few moments. First of all, his prayer has to do with his walk. In his prayer, he looks back on his own history and his own track record. And he says, remember, O Lord, how I've walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion have done what is good in your eyes. In other words, God, I do not deserve to die. I've been a good king. And he appeals to his faithfulness. He appeals to his devotion. He appeals to his goodness in the eyes of God. He says, these are reasons why I should not die. Now, before we dismiss this as selfish and arrogant, it actually does follow the pattern of a number of psalms, where in the psalms, sometimes the writer appeals to God on the basis of his own faithfulness. So in Psalm 18, the Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, he has rewarded me. Psalm 26, verse 1, vindicate me, O Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I've trusted in the Lord without wavering. And, and there are other similar psalms that say, God, treat me well because I have been a good guy. I have served you. Hezekiah prays that kind of prayer. But it is a prayer of self-preservation. He turned his face to the wall, it says. He wept bitterly, and he pleaded for his life. Now, this comes in the immediate aftermath of some fantastic victories God had given Hezekiah against Assyria. And in chapter 18 and 19, Hezekiah had walked by faith. Faith in God, trust in God. Here in chapter 20, he walks by sight. That is, he is rational about the situation. He weighs up what he can see. Everything he did earlier is explained by the fact he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. I'm reading quotations now. He held fast to the Lord. The Lord was with him. And so on that basis, he was a bold, he was a courageous leader. In fact, he was so courageous that back in chapter 18, verse 4, he removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah poles. That would have brought a lot of applause from the people. But then it says, he broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. Do you remember that? 
bronze snake Moses made when people were being bitten by poisonous snakes in the wilderness, and he took a sna- made a snake of bronze, put it on a pole. Anybody who'd been bitten by a snake could look at that pole, and they would live. And they'd kept it as a relic. And when Hezekiah had smashed the pagan idolatry, he took the bronze snake Moses had made, and he smashed it to pieces as well. Because this is up to that time, they were burning incense to it. This is a man of great courage. He knew that what God blesses is an expression of himself, the, the, the bronze serpent. He curses when it becomes a substitute for himself. He was a man of great courage, a man of great trust in God. In chapter 18 and 19, his theme would be, God is all you need. But now in chapter 20, He's not so sure. This sickness is unjust in the light of all that I have done. You know, it's a particular danger as we grow older that we look back on the Lord's working in our lives and we develop a sense of entitlement. This shouldn't happen to me. This needn't happen to me. Psalm 19 and verse 13. It's a prayer of David there. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Presumptuous sins are especially a pitfall for those who have walked closely with God. We feel we're entitled to a certain payback from God. This is my prayer in the battle when I'm in trouble or pain, you are still God. And I have a reason to worship. I'll bring praise. I'll bring praise. God is my victory. He is here. The idea of that being, I have nothing to ask, only to trust him. When I'm in battle, when I'm in trouble, when I'm in pain, thanking him for his presence and whatever it is that he wants to work out, But Hezekiah has become guilty of presumptuous sins. So when the bad news comes to him, he turned his face to the wall and he prayed. And that is a sulk. That's a sort of tantrum, isn't it, that he's having? He's believed the press about him. He's believed what people said about him as the great king of Judah. In the Second Chronicles version, it says, In those days Hezekiah became ill, was at the point of death. He prayed to the Lord who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign, but Hezekiah's heart was proud. And he did not respond to the kindness shown him. That's, by the way, why I said to be told you're going to die is a kindness. Then he can prepare for death. He didn't respond to the kindness God had given him. And shown him, he became proud. So his prayer, first of all, has to do with his walk. It's because I've walked with God over these years, I'm entitled for God to heal me. His second prayer has to do with the ways of his world. And by that I mean that he had seen great victory in the world around him. He just enjoyed, in the previous chapter, his greatest victory over Assyria. And Hezekiah was at his best in the great regional issues and conflicts of his day. He spread the big issues before the Lord. He speaks to the Lord. He doesn't try to guess and second guess what God will say. He listens to God. He hears his voice. He goes back to the Assyrians. He boldly tells them what God has said. That's where he's at his best. But now he's in a different world. It's his own personal world now behind closed doors. His body is sick. He's in personal trouble, and it's different for him. In public, he was bold. In private, he was afraid. Nationally, he was courageous. Personally, he was fearful. And his confidence in God in the big 
global external issues was not matched by his confidence in God in the personal private issues. That is a discrepancy that can arise very easily in the Christian life. Especially for those who are in ministry, where you're dealing with bigger issues and you're trusting God and you're interceding and you're seeing God do things. And then your own personal life, you suddenly hit a crisis or something begins to go wrong and the resources you have known in the big picture, you do not know in the little picture. This is a man whose public life has grown bigger than his private life. This is a man whose vocabulary is bigger than his experience. You know, every experience of God is a standalone experience. By that I mean this. We have to come to God every time we have a situation and we don't go back to what he did before and say, Lord, just repeat what he did before. We come to him freshly every time. We cannot live today's life on yesterday's blessings. We can't fight today's battles on yesterday's resources. That's why Jeremiah wrote, his mercies are new every morning. It's every day we come for that fresh supply. So Hezekiah's prayer has to do with his walk. I've walked well with God. Please heal me. Has to do with his ways now in the world. He could be strong and bold and courageous in the world, but weak and fearful, frightened in his personal life. Third area, his prayer has to do with his will. There is no acceptance of the will of God in this matter. Earlier in chapter 18, verse 5, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. He trusted him. Verse 6 of 18, he held fast the Lord. But now he's not trusting him. Now he's not holding fast to what God has said. Now he does not spread it out before the Lord, this issue that's come to him as he had before and listen to God as he had before and got a word from God as he had before. No, he's doing all the talking now. And his talking is saying, this should not happen to me, this will not happen to me, this cannot happen to me. I'm your faithful servant. If I go, who's going to take the throne here in Judah? I've been your good, faithful king. I'm not going to die. And so God listened to him. He didn't die. But he did not know the consequences that would come when he died and his 12-year-old son became the evil king of the nation. There are four imperative words in our prayer life, and these four imperative words are, your will be done. We bring situations before God, your will be done. We intercede for people, your will be done. Hezekiah prays against the will of God in this prayer. Put your house in order, you're going to die. That's the message from God. Remember, O oh Lord, I've walked before you faithfully with a wholehearted devotion, have done what's good in your eyes. Hezekiah wept bitterly. He doesn't accept this. You know, sometimes people feel that to pray if it's your will is a lack of faith. Because if nothing happens, you say, well, it wasn't the will of God. And therefore, it's, it's a lack of trust and confidence. And I've heard that a, a number of times. I, I remember some years ago now going to visit somebody who was in hospital, who was sick, who was uh, close to death, in fact. And there were half a dozen of us there. We stood around the bed and uh, we prayed and I prayed and I prayed that God would restore her and heal her if it was his will. On the way out to our car in the parking lot, one of the ladies who's in the group said to me, your prayer was not a prayer of faith. 
this evening. I said, why do you say that? She said, because you prayed that God will heal her if it's his will. That's not a prayer of faith. God doesn't heal her. You'll simply say, well, it wasn't his will. I said, well, I, I will conclude that. She said, but that isn't faith. Faith is affirming and declaring and being positive. I reject that totally. Asking God to do his will is not the opposite of faith. It is itself the expression of faith because you're trusting God knows exactly what he's doing and why and what is right. And the blockage in the road for many of us in our lives and our circumstances is we're not prepared to say, your will be done because when we do, then we can relax. Your will be done. And there's a wonderful liberty in that. A number of years ago, Hilary and I were in New Zealand and having a succession of a week of meetings in a number of different cities. We were there for a number of weeks. And we were in the city of Christchurch, uh, the second largest city of New Zealand out in the South Island. The meetings finished on the Thursday night, began the previous Saturday, went to the Thursday night. And on that Thursday night, I had spoken about Hezekiah and Manasseh. The next morning, we're about to leave the home where we were staying to go up to the uh, city of Wellington, our next stop, when the telephone in the home rang, and it was for me. And there was a young lady on the other end of the phone. She said to me, last night I slept through the night for the first time in five years. I said, I'm glad to know that. Why are you telling me? She said, for five years I have been in conflict with God over an issue that I insist that God brings into my life. And I realized last night I might be asking for a Manasseh. So last night, I went home and I said, Lord, I give this situation to you. Your will be done. And I slept through the night for the first time. I said, well, I'm delighted to hear that. And whatever else we... We talked about it, and the conversation was over. Several months later, I received a letter in the mail. And it began, you won't know me, but I talked to you on the telephone in Christchurch in New Zealand. I told you I'd slept through the night for the first time. She said, this is my story. A young man had come from Italy to work in New Zealand Beautiful Christian man, we got to know each other, we fell in love, we got engaged, he had to go back to Italy and the plan was that I would follow him in due course. When he got back to Italy, his communication with me began to lessen and began to feel something wasn't right and eventually he said to me, I don't think this is going to work. Italy is such a different culture different language, I think bringing you into Italy is going to be very hard for you. I think our relationship should finish. And so he broke it off. She said, I was heartbroken. I loved him. And I wanted to marry him. And I prayed, give me back that young man. So on that Thursday night, I said, Lord, your will be done. I let him go. Next day was Friday, and our church were having a retreat at a campsite, and we met at the church. We'd gone to different people's cars to take as few cars as we needed. And I got into a car with a young man who I didn't really know who came to our church, and we chatted on that journey, and we talked that weekend, and we've talked since. We've just got engaged. So I'm just writing to let you know that I would never have seen him if I hadn't said, Lord, your will be done. The irony is, you see, for five years she'd been saying, Lord, give me back that man. And this guy was sitting in the church the whole time. <laughs> so 
some years later, I was down in uh, New Zealand again, down in the southern city of Invercargill. It's the most southerly city in the world, they claim. And at the end of the first meeting there, a couple came to the front and talked to me, and she said, you don't know me, but we have corresponded. I said, really? She said, yes, I, I'm, I'm the one who hadn't slept for five years. Ah, oh, <laughs> I remember you. Who's this gentleman? Well, he's my husband. And I actually the next day went and had a cup of coffee with them in their home and talked to them. But the point is, if you insist on your own way with God, he might give it to you. And you may not know the consequences. Hezekiah never knew the consequences. He was dead before Manasseh became the evil influence he became. Don't demand your way with God. The Israelites did that in the wilderness over the manna that they were fed up of. God gave them manna every morning, every morning. And that's all they had to live, just enough to keep them alive. Manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner. You know, fresh in the morning, fried for lunch, toasted at night. Um, <laughs> manna burgers on a different day. Uh, manna cake on a birthday. Just manna, manna. They said to God, all we have is manna, 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 manna alive, we're sick of it. Give us some meat. And they pled with God, give us some meat, give them some meat. So God called him Moses, and Moses, they're demanding meat. All right, we'll give them meat. And they sent quail uh, for them. And they, were, they were, uh, couldn't believe, we've got this quail, this meat. And it says you ate the meat, not just for one day, or two days, or five days, or 10 days, or 20 days, but for a whole month until it's coming out of your nostrils and you loathe it. You imagine. And then it says they buried the people who craved other food. They got more than they bargained for. And writing about that event, the psalmist in Psalm 106 says, God gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. This is the epitaph you could write across Hezekiah. God gave him his request, but brought leanness into his soul. I'll not forget, when I was a teenager, early teens, there was a man in our church in England. It was a small church, not many people, but he developed leukemia in his 30s, had four young children. And the church arranged a prayer night to pray for him. And uh, I, as a, I think I was about 13 years of age, I went to that prayer night. And he asked to speak at the beginning of it. He expressed his gratitude to everybody coming out and praying for him and the love he'd received and shown. He said, but there's a verse in Psalm 106 that says, God gave them their request and sent leanness to their soul. As you pray for my leukemia, I do not want God to heal me and send leanness into my soul or the soul of my family. I want you to pray that God's will will be done. I remember being at that young age incredibly impressed with that willingness to let God have his way, whatever it might be. I didn't undermine the faith of the prayers. It actually strengthened them. We're not going to gang up on you, God, and twist your arm and get you to do things that you might not always do. We're going to say, God, we're bringing this situation to you. We bring this man to you. Have your way in his life. Don't pray prayers you wish you hadn't prayed. And to avoid that, for Hezekiah, we need to die to any sense of entitlement that we have. We feel, I deserve this. I'm entitled to this. We die to God having to repeat the blessing he gave me in the past today. He has worked. He may not in this situation do what I'd like him to do. And we have to die to our own will. That we're not using God as an agent of our own agenda. We're bringing our lives to be an agent of God's agenda. Your will be done.
This is my prayer in the battle. When I'm in trouble or pain, you are still God. And I have a reason to worship. I will bring praise. I'll bring praise. God is my victory. And he is here. And we lay it before him and leave it with him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the tremendous privilege of prayer, the access that you have given us, not just into your head, but into your heart. And we want to bring those things to you that we know touch your heart. And we don't understand the workings of God in our world very often, in fact, mostly. Thank you that we can intercede, and as we do so, we can discern your mind and your will as you work in us. You've declared things that are your will. We can pray emphatically about those things. But we pray you'll deliver us from any sense of entitlement to any particular blessing other than the presence of God in our hearts, the forgiveness that was purchased at the cross, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, the promise to lead and to guide us. We believe and we claim all of your promises to us. But we pray we won't feel ourselves to be entitled beyond what you've promised and to walk humbly with you. And when we do leave this life, to leave it on schedule and to look back with gratitude for all that you have been to us. Apply your word to our hearts, we pray. Help us to live it out in whatever circumstance we're facing at the moment. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. To watch this message again, go to our website, livingtruth.ca. You can also order DVDs and CDs, download transcripts, sign up for our monthly newsletter, check out the Living Truth Daily Devotional, sign up for podcasts, and read faith stories from other viewers. We love to hear from you, so send us your comments and testimonies. Living Truth is supported by viewers like you. Thank you for transforming lives through your financial participation. Join us next week for a Christmas message from Charles Price. This is Living Truth. The story told over endless years of a starry night a mother's tears when through the stillness you could hear a baby's cry into the darkness shone a holy light with a song to warm the coldest night a host of angels sang a sweet refrain Their song, the cry of Bethlehem Behold your God, behold your King This tiny child salvation brings Repeat the sounding joy again the cry of Bethlehem from heaven's home he humbly came then bending low to wear my shame the 
breath of God, His Word became a baby's cry. Beyond the skies, beyond these days, will our anthem ring with ceaseless praise. Let us adore Him, the one who came, echo the cry. Behold your God, behold your King, this tiny child salvation brings. Repeat the sounding joy again, well this is the cry of Bethlehem. Repeat the sounding joy. This Christmas Eve, we will gather near with the tender ones we hold so dear. But through the stillness, may we hear a baby's cry. Your generous contributions support the work of Living Truth, the media ministry of the People's Church Toronto. If any approved project target has been met, the remaining funds will be used where most needed.